Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the HR Leaders Podcast, the show where we explore the future of work with industry experts and HR executives and the world's leading global brands. Today, we have a special guest on the show. We're joined by Patrick McGuinness, who's an author, TED speaker, and a host of FOMO Sapiens, the FOMO Sapiens Podcast. Welcome to the show. How are you, Patrick? Hey there. How are you? Nice, nice of you to join us. Where are you uh, joining us from? Right now, I'm, I'm, I typically live in New York City, but right now I am in the great state of Maine, where I grew up at my, I'm actually my parents' house, so. Nice. This is the nice. dead where I grew up. The new studio. Is, is exactly. this where you grew up as well? Yeah, this is my childhood home. I was brought home from the hospital to this very home. Love it, love it, love it. Have you been there the whole, the whole time during this? No, I stayed in New York City. Um, I was busy trying to launch a book. And so I stayed in New York because I figured it would be easier to focus. And I also thought as much as I love spending time at home, if this were to go on for six months, which it has, um, I thought it would be better to just come and go a bit. So basically every time I come here, I just take a COVID test right away. As soon as I get my results, I then take off the mask and can hang out. So before we jump in, Badger, tell everyone a little bit more about yourself and sort of your journey to where we are today. Sure. So I started out my career on Wall Street doing venture capital and private equity. I did that for a number of years, was a graduate of Harvard Business School. And then in 2008, everything blew up. I was working for a division of AIG. The company went bankrupt and was taken mm -hmm. over by the government. It was a great lesson to me about the power of diversification. I basically started at that point to diversify my career um, by doing investments on the side uh, outside of my day job. That turned into a book called 10% Entrepreneur. And then when that book came out, um, I invented the term FOMO when I was a student at Harvard Business School, and people started wanting to talk about that. And so I decided to write a book so about funny, that, right? and <laughs> a podcast called FOMO Sapiens. And, and so here I am. Wow. What a cool journey. I, know. I, feel like, I feel like I'm almost doing that myself. Like, but I'm, I'm like ten. I'm like ten years behind you, of sort of, ex, of trying to diversify my career. And I started this business. I'm like, and I've got the podcast. <laughs> I'm just some steps behind uh, on this process as well. There's a lot going on. So let's start with. Um, you've got the new book, right? Tell people a bit more about that. That's how I came across you. Super excited for it, but what a time to launch a book <laughs> during this as well. Just tell everyone about the book, first it, of all. Yeah, launching a book during the during this period of time has been so difficult. Uh, you know, I'm not complaining because it is what it is, but people are very preoccupied with other things. So I don't think a lot of people are reading. Um, but we've been lucky that it's taken off in its own way and it's doing pretty well. But basically, the point of the book, the book is called Fear of Missing Out practical decision making in a world of overwhelming choice. And basically the idea here is that we live in a time where we are overwhelmed with choice, whether it's what to watch on Netflix or what to do to, to deal with the current economic and, and, and healthcare situation. There are so many things we have to decide. And so my book is all about how to make smarter, faster decisions um, when we're faced with all of the things that we have to decide on. And so that's really something I've implemented in my own life, but also I interviewed tons of clinical psychologists and business mm -hmm. leaders and entrepreneurs about how to make better decisions. Super timely as well, right? Like given everything, going, that is one of the big challenges. I'm so, I certainly faced it as a leader of this, big, of this business as well. It's like so overwhelming with it going on. And obviously that's the kind of nature of the, going, of the book is you know, making decisions during when it's quite overwhelming. There's a lot of crisis going on around you. So I'm sure people are very much connected with the book. Yeah, I've heard, you know, I'm hearing back from a lot of people who've been using the book and the, the big the big feedback that I'm getting is that, you know, what it really does is I think a lot of us feel like we, we are good at making decisions. You know, we we make decisions all the time. Right. And so the typical reaction that I get from people when we talk about this subject is, is that, well, I'm good at making decisions, but my wife or my friend or my kid or my parent or my colleague, they're terrible. We all think that we're good and other people are bad. But in fact, if we step back and look at our, how we make our decisions, most people don't even really sort of think about it. You just sort of, you do it reflexively. And then when you get stuck, you sort of just get frustrated. And so what I sort of give you in, in the book is really a system to step back and categorize decisions based on their importance and then move past the, the sort of unimportant ones very quickly and then have a process for the big ones that'll move you forward so you don't get stuck because I used to get stuck all the time. I mean, I was constantly paralyzed by indecision and now having developed that muscle to make decisions, I got to tell you, life is just a lot easier. 
I can only imagine, and I'm super excited to start using it myself as a co-founder. That's half my battle is <laughs> decision making, making decisions, and now having a framework and a process to work towards is is I mean to work with and have have that foundation and structure just makes things so much easier. Yeah, especially um, when you have a co-founder, as you mentioned, this is not just about you; it's also about getting other people. So you know, you may be decisive, right? It may be that you know, Chris, you're you have no issues here, um, but it may be that your co-founder or your business partner does. And so you also need to have strategies to help push them into decision making. And that relates across any business, any leadership role, any organization. So it's super relevant. Just want to go back for a second. Obviously you're on LinkedIn. The first thing that stood out when I first came across your LinkedIn, LinkedIn profile was like inventor of FOMO. <laughs> and I was like, I've got to reach out to this guy. <laughs> I just, after that fear of missing out inventor, I was like, really, how did that happen? And how does it feel that like, millions of people around the world use that terminology. I mean, there's no words to describe it. It's so funny. And I think it's really <laughs> cute because like my family members, every time they see FOMO someone, they send it to me. But you know, it's-, it's Oh my God, how many messages are you getting? The next day, I saw FOMO here. Um, or, you know, the next door neighbor saw FOMO on television. Yes, I'm glad to hear it. But you don't need to tell me every time. No, it's a lot of fun because everywhere you go in the world, people know the topic. And so it's just fun when people realize and hear the story, they always, smile and it's a great point of connection and and the story is that i was um i was living in new york city in the early 2000s right out of college and i lived through september 11th i was very sort of right by my apartment i saw that with my own eyes and the next day i woke up and i just said you know life is really short i need to live every moment like it's last i got to take care of take advantage of every option or possibility that i can and that's what I did. And then shortly thereafter, I entered Harvard Business School, which is what I call a choice rich environment. I mean, you can do anything you want. There's so many things that are offered to you, whether it's parties or trips or classes or interviews for jobs or you name it. There's just a lot going on. And I decided because I had this sort of carpe diem mindset that I wanted to do everything. And I tried to the point where I was constantly stressed out. And I realized that actually, like all of this opportunity and choice was causing me stress rather than making me happy. And I started sort of teasing people, my friends, because we'd go to like seven parties on a Friday night. And so, I, you know, we'd, as soon as we get there, we'd be out the door for the next one. And so I started referring to that as a fear of missing out. I shortened it to FOMO. And I wrote an article in the school newspaper way back in 2004, all about this new word that I'd come up with. And then I graduated and the word was used on campus and eventually it was spread into the corporate world. And then in 2013, it made it into the Oxford Dictionary. So- Oh, it's in the dictionary as well. I didn't even know that. <laughs> yeah, thank you, England. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> no, God, what a story. Because when I saw it, I was like, did you, you know, you see some weird and wonderful things on people's LinkedIn profiles. And I was like, really? Yeah. I've got to do the research into this uh, as well. Yeah. well. I would say the thing is most people, and I love LinkedIn, but you know, half the people are like um, innovator. Um, uh, you know, um, like, uh, futurist. Yeah. Like all these people who put things that I'm like, really? Like, are you truly a visionary thinker? You know, like it's like. What does that even mean? How do you, def how do you define that? Exactly. <laughs> it's super difficult. Mine's uh, for real, I promise. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, in terms of this new book, what was the main inspiration? You've, wrote, you've written many books before. Uh, what did you, what were some of the sort of top things that, that drove you to, to writing this new one? So really, it's funny, you know, when I, when I went on book tour for my first book, The 10% Entrepreneur, I did book tour, I went everywhere. I mean, the book came out um, all over the place and all these different languages. And so, you know, in the UK, it did really well. So I was in the UK a lot, but also, uh, you know, everywhere from like, Senegal to Myanmar to Guinea-Bissau to Brazil, all over the place. And what would always happen, regardless of where I was in the world, is that people would want to take a selfie with me because I came up with FOMO. And so it occurred to me that people, you know, it's a topic they want to discuss. And I think what's important for us is, as people who are creators um, and business people is to listen to the market. And the market was giving me an undisputed message. The yeah. market is saying people want to talk about FOMO. And so then I thought, well, okay, great. So I know that there's an interest in this topic, but like, what could I possibly, what, what can I say about this? Is this really, is this justify writing a book? And so as I researched the topic a little bit more. I realized actually it's become a major um, area of study in the world of clinical psychology. And that actually like, this is something that is paralytic to a lot of people. And that in the business world, it's also a major issue. and so. 
I'm a business writer. I like to focus on business topics. I'm a venture capitalist. And I thought there is really an opportunity here to take this topic that a lot of people think is kind of funny or lighthearted and actually look at it in a deep way and see how we can make better decisions. What were some of the findings that you did, you found during your research that most surprised you that stood out? Well, it's amazing. Uh, so I started reading these psychology journals, you know, that are like people like me, you know, like University of Essex professor writes for the Journal of Clinical Psychology, that kind of like, you know, people who are like real people. And um, what was so interesting was number one, how this actually has sort of physical effects on people. It causes physical repercussions on your wellness. It causes mental uh, health issues. It causes issues with your finances. People spend money. But then the couple other things that I thought were interesting is number one, is how this does sort of, there's a genetic component. It's in our, it's in our evolutionary biology. Okay. Humans were, were looking at that, you know, they didn't have Instagram, but they were well aware of what the next person over from them had when they were like setting up the camp when they were nomadic. You know, one guy had like, he, you know, somebody killed like a buffalo and this guy over here is feeling FOMO because, you know, it's literally survival or, or, or not, right? Literally, it's built in our, built in our DNA. Uh, and the other thing I thought was quite interesting that I, I guess I had never really thought about deeply is that how much FOMO is used against us as a marketing tool. Oh, right? yeah. So good. They're so good at leverage. They're so good at it, aren't they? <laughs> they're so good at they're so They know exactly what to say, what visuals to put in front of you. Uh, yeah. Cool. What are some of the practical um, frameworks or examples you share in the book of things that people can do? So one of the big strategies that I use in the book, and, and this is for FOMO, but also for what's called FOBO or fear of a better option, which is the other foe I invented. Fear of a better option. I do love that one. Yeah. It never got famous until, well, I'm making it famous now, but it didn't get famous when FOMO did, even though they're like created at the same time. Um, I did this, this, this TED video um, called how to make faster decisions. And basically what happens a lot of times when we feel these foes, FOMO and FOBO, is that when, you, when you're feeling fear and stress, little things feel bigger than they are. Mm. And so for example, say you're ordering, I, I, this happens to me all the time, you go like Deliveroo in the UK or Seamless in the US, you wanna order food to your house. Well, there's like 400 choices. And so I will, I, I, I'm supposed to be immune to this stuff. I'll spend like 40 minutes trying to pick something to eat for dinner and just quit and eat cereal, right? It's like the small decisions become yeah. And so what I, I basically, in, in, in this, the book and in the video, I classify decisions in one of three categories, high stakes, low stakes, or no stakes. High stakes decisions are things that will affect you in the medium to long term. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. who should I marry? What house should I buy? What job should I take? Yeah. Um, low stakes are things that, you know, you won't remember having made that decision in a month. It's like, oh, what printer should I buy? What, what, restaurant, should I buy? what restaurant should we eat at? Yeah. And then no stakes are things you won't remember in a couple of days. It's like, what shirt should I wear? Which, you know, which, which, which should I have for lunch? And yeah. so for one of the things that I love to do and tell people to do, and you can start right now doing this is when you get to a no stakes decision, you got to outsource that. And I outsource it to like my phone or my watch. So for example, say uh, automate, automate all of those decisions. Totally. Yeah. Should, yourself up. <laughs> should I go for a run today? Should I go for a run today? Like, you know, most of the time I'll know the answer, but if I'm stuck on that, then I don't want to spend the next 40 minutes hemming and hawing about whether to go for a run. So I'll say, fine, I'm going to look at my phone. The even number, if it's the time is even, I'm going to go for the run. If it's odd, I'm not going to go is for the run. Is that what you do? <laughs> Boom. Are you really? I just look at it. It's 1130 here. So it's okay. It's, it's even. I'm going to go for a run today. Now, I'm not no. going actually because I did. No, no, I just love us the simplicity of it. <laughs> Done. And, uh, you know, I'll ask somebody to make mom. Should I go for a run today? Yes or no? Done. Um, I do that all the time. So outsourcing in unimportant decisions gives you the freedom to focus on things that matter. What, what about Risa? Did you interview other leaders during oh, this? Yeah. And so what were some of the stories that stood out? I did. It, it was so fun because um, unlike the first book where I'd never done this before, like this time around, I kind of got it and I was like, okay, I'm going to interview some really amazing people. I'm just going to like go crazy. And so um, one of my favorite interviews was with the CEO of Hotel Tonight um, about how they actually created a digital tool to overcome indecision. So when they have a daily um, sort of special called the Daily Drop, and when you're presented with the opportunity, you're given 15 minutes, then it's gone forever. 
So they oh, is that like a price for a room or something? What was that? Was yeah, that like? extra okay. discount. So you okay. get that deal, but like you you cannot delay. Well, that's the ultimate fear of missing out, though, isn't it? <laughs> that's a really good example of a re- uh, they've made a brand around miss fear of missing out every it's week. Fantastic tool. So I talked to him, but I also interviewed like everybody from a neurobiologist to um, a, a, the head of Opus Day in Canada, clinical psychologists. Um, venture capitalists, you know, VCs or entrepreneurs. So all these really interesting people um, mm-hmm. that informed what I wrote about in the book. And so it ended up being, cause you know, when you're writing a book about clinical psychology and about this kind of stuff, it's like, you know, yeah, I, I have my perspective, but I also want to make sure that I get really good expertise in here because, you know, I'm a business, yeah. person, business person. I'm not a clinical psychologist. So I want to make sure I cover those bases appropriately. What were some of the questions you were asking them? Were you asking them to share their own journeys of that, like that, an example of when they felt the fear of missing out? If so, <laughs> what were some of the things they came back with? What yeah, somebody- absolutely. I, you know, I think we all, it's funny because people always share with me what gives them FOMO, right? It's like this thing, I meet somebody and they're like, they, they want to tell me. And so, and it's most of the things um, that people feel FOMO about are, they're not deep, they're small. I mean, we all have deeper FOMO too, but it'll be like, I feel FOMO yeah. about, you know, when I go on Instagram or something. But I think at the end of the day, if we look at what the deeper sort of connection is between all of these things, when we feel FOMO, it's because we have a perception that there's something great out there happening and we haven't taken the time to unpack whether perception is reality or perception is deception. And so Which is social happening. media makes that a lot more difficult. <laughs> right? Filter. Yeah. Like it looks nice right now. We look both like... We both look like we're in nice places. It may be, by the way. It's, it's pouring down with rain outside right now. Smelly, I don't know. Maybe there's a smelly dog right underneath me. There isn't. But, you know, you just don't know. Yeah. Did you, have a, did you ever feel a fear of missing out when you made a decision to leave your career and follow pursue, pursue this career? Or do you have, does that ever come around for you? You know, you know yeah. I'll tell you why. Because the decision was based on an informed decision. I had worked in that world. I knew what it was. Mm-hmm. I lived through a very difficult time where my firm blew up. And I was like, this is no longer for me. I want to create something for myself. And I think what happens is when you're building something for yourself, as you're doing and as I'm doing, you don't have FOMO because you're sort of like, I'm in the right place. Like, I guess if you fail, to be in this place. Yeah. If you fail and then you see all your friends who stuck behind, Mm-hmm. Perhaps you're like, oh, I, you know, you have regrets or something. But in general, when you love what you're doing and you believe in it, you're not going to spend a lot of time focusing on other people, right? You're focusing on what you're building. What What about the current events? How does that affect your outlook on your work? Uh, obviously, you, you you kind of coined the fear of going out, FOGO, which uh, which was interesting. But how has it shifted your views, or has it shifted views on on the work? It's been so interesting to, I mean, having lived this in New York City, which was the global epicenter for a period of time, it was a difficult time and it probably will be again, but I I tried to also sort of keep on the hat of a clinician or a researcher and trying to think like, well, let me look at this. I'm gonna step out of my own daily drama and just kind of look at this studiously. And what I saw is in the beginning of the pandemic lockdown, so we locked down in New York City around um, the, 13th, I believe, of March. So the weekend before, actually, I had family in town visiting. And I went to probably like to see like one of the last Broadway plays before they shut everything down. Like it was like, now I look back and it's like, I did the last this, I did the last that. I did like, you know, um, I, I remember trying to buy toilet paper because my mom was like, you need to buy toilet paper. There's a ride on toilet. So there was this FOMO around just like getting toilet paper, buying canned goods, like getting all the supplies, this panic buying, right? And then once we went inside and went into the quarantine, I remember seeing on Twitter a lot of conversation like, well, it looks like FOMO's dead and, you know, Corona killed FOMO. And for a couple of weeks, I sort of thought that's actually quite interesting because, you know, for the first time in years, I have nowhere to go. And so I was reading all the right? I read these books I've been meaning to read for years. I watched like Succession, which I'd wanted to watch for like three years. You know, I was watching all the streaming, this, that, and the other. But then, you know, what happened, of course, is that, you know, we all want to have these big plans of like, I'm going to get super ripped or I'm going to learn how to do this or that, but I'm going to write a book or, you know, all these sorts of things. But about a month into it, I realized basically, you know, the one thing that causes FOMO in our lives that that, that goes without fail to give us FOMO is, is our 
devices, our phones and everything. And the one thing I had with me the whole time was this bad boy right here. And in yeah. fact, I, my sort of Zoom social life and my amount of time spent on social media went through the roof. And so therefore, I really believe FOMO has come back in a, in a huge way. And it's come back also like, you know, I go on Instagram now, all my British, all my friends who live in London are like off in Ibiza living their best lives while I'm like stuck in New York. And so as, lot, as Europe, and we'll see what happens, but Europe, yeah. people are like, in, everybody's in the south of France. And like, I'm, I'm like afraid to leave my apartment. And so I feel massive FOMO. I'm like, God, I wish I lived in Europe right now, right? I could be, you know, hanging out. Instead, I'm like, just excited to like go to the grocery store. So it's been interesting in that way. I think, you know, what I've learned here is that human nature cannot be changed. And therefore we are, we are, you know, we revert back to the same sorts of behaviors. Yeah. You did make a really interesting point though, because during COVID, right, so many people started investing in their own personal health and well-being and, and just learning new skills in general. I was thinking, why is that? Obviously one obviously is that we're all, you're locked inside. So you need something to do. But a big part of that, like I think which you tapped into is that there isn't this party you're going to miss out on. There isn't this holiday or this birthday you're going to miss out on. There isn't all of these things that you're still so wrapped up in that you don't even get a time to just, where's the Chris time? Like me to invest in myself. And I saw so many people doing that. And then soon as my wife's a good example, she was started doing exercising more and then sort of doing more focusing on her own health and well-being. But as soon as um, a lockdown was lifted and people were like, oh, this birthday party is happening, this family gathering event, that all went out the window. <laughs> and I said to her the other day, I was like, what, what happened to the exercise routine? What happened to the daily check-ins with yourself, right? Uh, and she's like, oh no, but this is happening or that's happening. And I was like, so you've already, you've been locked back into the FOMO. <laughs> uh, no, it's uh, immediately. So true. <laughs> so true. I have a, I was out in the Hamptons and again with the, the same friend who had um, was, you know, didn't want to go in the supermarket. And she had been super careful for months and months and months and hadn't seen anybody. And this was her first time with people, but we were all, you know, a big house in distance. And we were invited to a barbecue and none of us had been in a group. And we go to this, it's all British people actually. So I'll blame the Brits. And they'd all had COVID. Yeah, they can't hold themselves. <laughs> well, they, weren't, they weren't afraid, right? Because they'd all had it and they had antibodies or whatever. We, we didn't. And it was insane to me how quickly you just sort of forgot and you were like human nature is to get together in a group. And I found myself talking to like seven people in a circle and yeah. then I was like, what am I doing? Right. And so I stepped back and we ended up leaving. And the next morning, the big conversation was like, why did we do that? Now this was a while ago. Everything is fine, but yeah. you know, human nature to want to be with other people, to want to participate in events. And so like staying home and, and being, you know, doing sort of like all the self care, uh, -huh. Sounds great, but how many people did the things they thought they were going to do? You know, everybody thought they were going to get like rock hard abs. How many people did it? <laughs> a few. People started off and they were like, ah. <laughs> I, I, I share that same experience, by the way. I went to a, a, a kind of party in the park, like, a, a, you know, and, and I was like, all right. I wasn't too sure about it. This is very early on. I was like, I didn't really want to go, but my wife was like, I really want to go. We need to get out the house. I was like, okay, we go there. Well, your wife sounds super fun. I definitely want to. She is so. I am the. I am the drag. She is super fun, outgoing, going out. I'm party. I'm just like, no, I'll stay at home. <laughs> uh, you know, and uh, we go there. And as you said, within the first five, to, even even when people were arriving, they were kissing each other on the cheeks, and I, and they were like, oh, sorry, ha ha ha. And I was like, this is just. I was like, this is. And and my my daughter was there. She's two, right? So you can't. Can you ask a two year old to social distance? Yeah. She's running around hugging everyone. I was like, well, it's too late at this point. If I'm going to catch it, it's probably going to be now. I was a bit annoyed and frustrated, but I was like, we should never have come in the first place. Uh, <laughs> it's super difficult. What, what about the podcast? Tell us more about the podcast, the name behind it as well, which is interesting. Um, yeah. Sapiens. Where did that come from? The inspiration. Bomo well, Sapiens was this idea, actually, that I was... I was looking uh, to name, so I was looking to do a podcast. I got approached by a media partner and said, you want to do a show? And I said, sure. And I was going to do it about my first book, 10% Entrepreneur. But then the more I thought about it, the more I thought, you know, this FOMO is such a great topic and people want to talk about this. And it's a fun idea and, and I love it. And I'm going to be writing a book about it. So it really makes sense for me. And it's broad. And so I started um, thinking about names and I just talk to, you know, my solution to everything and is basically like talk to as many people as possible and get as many ideas as possible and then make a list of everything and just wait until the perfect one hits. Like, and I know it, like I know it when I see it, right? You know when you see so it. I was, as I've talked to more and more people, 
somebody came up with that idea. The minute they said it, I knew it was perfect. I called my attorney, who's a you know a patent attorney, and we we got a trademark on it. And and then then another friend of mine from college, I have a logo, which is the progression of man, you know, from the caveman to the man, and um, that was his idea. And so I called my. I have a person on my team who does graphic design. She put together this beautiful logo, and so that we were off to the races with the name and everything. And then I started to think, you know, well, what is this show really about? And so I started reaching out to my friends who I thought would be interesting guests. And I know some people who are super interesting, cool people that are that are, you know, like the COO of Reddit is a friend of mine from college, mm -hmm. and other people like that. And then over time, you know how it goes: is the as your show kind of takes off and gets more popular. People start calling you, and so I've been getting amazing um, inbound pitches from some great guests, and so just kind of you know now I'm on like episode uh, I don't How know sixty six or something. How long have you been going for? Ah, uh, geez, now two thousand about two years. Yeah, where can people check it out? Is it it's Harvard, right? You're so it's part, it's 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 distributed by Harvard Business Review, but you can find yeah. it on all of the you know all of the platforms. Almost sapien two words. It's on every platform and um, you know, it's been cool, but I'm sure you have this happen too. It's like, I had a guy the other day in Brazil. <laughs> well, listen, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm indecisive in my life right now. I'm really going through some stuff mm -hmm. and I, um, I have an, I have a drive every day and I found your podcast and I listened to all the episodes. I mean, listen to like all six. It's, it's funny how people, when they find your podcast, the first thing you do, and I'm the same, by the way, you do not binge listening. If you really enjoy it, that is obviously you just go yeah, through it. I just, and so like that, it's so cool, right? I felt so pleased to hear that. But, you know, I think that it's a topic that resonates with people. And it's so, if you like it, if you like the sound of this voice and you like good conversation, <laughs> um, you know, FOMO Sapiens, check it out. No, I get it. How did the tech thing, TED thing come about? Did they come to you or you go to, was it, was it, was it a TED, TED, like the official TED or TEDx? Because I know there's like a million different ones that are happening these days. So it was official TED. And it was part of this really cool that adds to the pressure because I know how much more work they go and more more rehearsals you have to do and go and tell everyone how that works because yeah, I think it's interesting. It, it was wild actually. So I had uh, wanted to do a TED talk for a long time and I had thought about doing a TEDx and TEDx is great. Yeah. But I had a friend who used to work at TED and he said, "Listen, why don't you you know if you really want to do this, like hold out for the TED." And so um, I said, okay, fine. And then it turned out that I was introduced to somebody who works there on the business team. And I grabbed a coffee with her just to get her advice. You know, yeah, I think a lot of times, like when you go and trying to pitch people, it turns yeah. them off. And so I wasn't trying to pitch her. I was like, you know, just like, I'd love to talk about my ideas with you and get your advice about how I could, you know, come up with an idea that might be interesting for you guys. And so we talked. And um, that was it. And then like six months later, she pinged me and said, listen, we're doing a video series with Dropbox. It's a different format. Instead of being in front of an audience, you're in a studio and it's like almost like a, it's like a short, it's like six minutes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and I was sort of like, that's actually really cool. And so I, they gave me a, a writer um, and we worked on it together and it was really helpful to have a writer, but it, you know, at the end of the day, you sort of have to, it's on you. You have to. Yeah, you, exactly. Yeah. And, and I was actually like, while we were preparing this, this was a year ago, I was actually in the middle of Central Asia. I was in like Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan on this big trip. So I'm like, I didn't really have internet and I was sort of like trying to figure it out. And so I'm like in the middle of Uzbekistan going back and forth with my TED coach. And when I got back, I had three weeks before taping and I had put on all this weight on holiday. So I decided I need to lose like as much weight as I could to look good on the camera. And I worked out so much that I actually like injured myself and I had to like limped into the taping. It was, it was a lot, but, but the great thing was that they're so, um, you know, they really, they really are just great people to work with. And so I did the taping about a year ago. It came out in December, um, first on Facebook and LinkedIn and later it's on their site. And since then it's done something like, I think like 1.3 or 1.4 million views. And that's so how I came across you. It's crazy. Ah, oh, it's I it's came a, you from the that's how, by the way, that is how I when I reached out to you, I'm not sure if I said that, but that's how I came across was that was that video. But look, I'm conscious of time, so I'm gonna have to let you go at some point. I know. <laughs> for, uh, for before we wrap up, if there's sort of one parting piece of advice you give to everyone to uh, deal with their FOMO, <laughs> what would that be? And then where can people um check out more about your work, grab a copy of the book, et cetera? So my advice to everybody today, and I think it's particularly relevant right now, is um be grateful. So be grateful you have options in the first place. 
if you have FOMO or FOBO, it means that you're, you have choices. And I think a lot of times having more choices makes us feel stressed out, but actually you should be happy that you have those choices because when you're on your deathbed and you look back, you're going to be like, wow, I live such a rich and full life because I could do all of these things. And, and I think that's, you know, there's a lot of people out there who don't have choices because of um, illness or poverty or, you know, a lot of other things that marginalize people. And so I, I always try to remember that every yeah. day. And, you know, I'm sure, you know, Jay Shetty. Um, yeah. the, so mm-hmm. him on my podcast, we'll be running that in the fall. And like, he has his book coming out and I read it and it's, it's great. And he talks about like this, my um, gratefulness meditation, what he does, which I, at the beginning I read that I was like, Oh, it's kind of, I don't know. That's <laughs> not me, but I have to tell you, if you actually do it, if you actually take a few minutes every day to think about three things that you feel thankful for, it mm-hmm. actually changes your mindset. So try it out. I, I, you know, I thought it was a little like woo woo in the beginning, but then once I started doing it, I actually kind of liked it. So yeah, I do that by the way. I'm not consistent with it, but um, I do it in the morning because I, I suffer from anxiety and that's something that I find it helps. If I wake up in the morning and think about three things that I'm thankful for, because normally what do you do when you wake up in the morning? You think of the stress or the things you got to do. Most people don't wake up in bed. I got that piece of work. To Where is the coffee? That's what I, I'm bad in the morning. So I don't, I don't, I'm not that guy. Yeah, like, coffee first bed. and then you're allowed to think. Is that what it is? Like the yeah. only thought allowed is like get coffee and then your brain's allowed to run where it wants to run. <laughs> don't look at a screen for the first 15 minutes. Just let yourself wake up. Yeah, that's what I do. So but, um, no, I think, I'm glad that works for you. Cause I think a lot, it does work for a lot of people. And, and if you're not, yeah. doing it, give it a try. And there's no downside. Um, yeah, they think of negative things, then it kind of oh. defines your day almost, right? Um, and I found that as long as, because again, most people sit there the night before they go to sleep, and then when they wake up, they're worrying about things they haven't done, tasks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Whereas opposed to starting your day with what am I grateful for today? The fact that you know I'm healthy during this, the fact that uh, my my wife and child and I have a roof over our heads. These are all things that we take for granted every day. Like I've seen a lot of people complaining they couldn't go on holiday this year. I'm like, come on. Like, yes, you can't go on holiday, but like, be great. Be great. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. Like, that's a massive own goal to just start the day worrying about stuff you can't even change. Right. I, that's the, yeah. I mean, I think we, you know, we agree. Yeah. And uh, where can people learn more about you? Grab a copy of the book. So, the best place to find me is at patrickmcginnis.com. Uh, there you'll find links to Amazon and other places. There's a Kindle version out. We're coming out with the audiobook in the fall. And then the podcast is FOMO Sapiens. You can find that wherever you find your podcast. It's two words. So check it out. And um, I'm obviously also on social. So Twitter at PJ McGinnis and Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis. My Instagram, I promise, full of good stuff. Nice. Well, I appreciate you uh, saying yes. It's been a really cool conversation. And um, I look forward to the, reading the book and checking out the podcast as well. And uh, yeah, see you again soon. All right. Thanks. Yeah, a lot. You, you in the UK, hopefully. And not- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely. See you later. Thanks. Take care. Cheers. Bye. Bye.